We believe in the inviolable worth and equal dignity of every member of the human family. Why? Yeah. Because if I look at any two people and I measure them according to any one metric, well, this guy's going to be smarter than that guy. This guy's going to be tougher than that guy. This guy's going to be more economically viable than this guy. In what sense are they equal? Yeah. Like equal how? Equal in what? And people start to see, oh, yeah, it's a belief. I think in the end, it's easier to say to somebody, uh, you believe this and here's why you're right. Then here's you believe this and here's why you're wrong. Huh. Of course, all of us yeah. have beliefs that need to be affirmed and challenged in light of the gospel. It's just so much more of an appealing approach to be able to say these convictions you hold are very dear to you, but actually they only hold up on Christian premises. Hello and welcome to Post Christianity. We are a podcast thinking about how we got here and how we move on from this moment. My name is Glenn Scrivener and I'm joined by Andrew Wilson. Great yeah. to be here. Very good to be here. It's a new podcast and uh, we want to figure out uh, the history of how we got to this particular cultural moment so that we can be oriented to face the future as uh, the Church of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, Andrew, do you want to uh, introduce yourselves? Yourselves. <laughs> there are all, all, all we five are of us. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Andrew Wilson and I'm the teaching pastor at King's Church London. And I've uh, recently written a book which has gone in quite, quite a deep dive on this sort of theme mm -hmm. called Remaking the World. So, as you indeed have yourself. Right. So, I wrote a book that came out last year called The Air We Breathe How We All Came to Believe in Things Like progress and kindness and compassion and all those sorts of uh, good things uh, that we now take for granted in the post-Christian West. And so we thought we'd get together and have a conversation about this sort of stuff. Um, I thought we could begin in 1776, which is... It has a, a my favorite year. Yeah, yeah it, it seems like. Have you done a control F on your manuscript to discover how many times you mentioned 1776 in your, in your I book? I actually have not. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should. Yeah, um, an awful lot. Hundreds, I would say. Yeah. So I wrote a, a book really about the way in which we became effectively the post-Christian West got formed through this one particular year and um, and looking at it as a sort of window into all of the deeper historical developments that have created the world as it currently is. So why we're right. Western and educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, ex-Christian, romantic. And so it sounds a bit jargony, but the idea is to sort of say, this is how the modern West functions and feels, and to tell that story through the lens of a particular year where there was a lot of change that created the world that we're in now. Yes, and that spells the acronym WEIRDER. It does. Uh, because WEIRD was already an acronym in use by people like Joseph Henrik, who sort of coined the phrase back in the 2000s, yep. uh, evolutionary biologist at Harvard, I believe. Yep. And uh, he was noticing that those in the West are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. You've added two extra letters, ex-Christian and romantic, and we'll, yes. we'll press into that and why you did that. But first of all, let's let's get a sense of the weirdness of the West. Yeah. Um, as an evolutionary biologist, he was noticing that all the psychological studies that people were doing were incredibly um, narrow in their focus because you generally just want to get 20-year-olds who are on a university campus, you offer them a free slice of pizza, and they will do your <laughs> yes, study for them. Exactly. And doing it Turns out most of the world don't think like 20-year-old <laughs> graduate or undergraduates at universities. Ex right. Exactly. And 90-plus and percent of all like psychological studies were kind of done on that kind of demographic. And it, it, it turns out that what we thought of as natural, obvious, and universal about human beings is nothing of the sort. It's very weird. Yeah. Um, give us a, a sense of some of the weirdness of the West and how we are different to other times and places. Yeah, so obviously we're, it, we would talk about being Western, which is a very strange term, mm -hmm. but uh, we speak and think in English, which is itself a, a strange, you know, obviously quite a narrow slice of humanity, but we think it's normalized. We are all literate. Uh, pretty much everybody listening to this and everybody within 10 miles of us is can read. And in fact, not only can read, but can't not read. So if you get shown a page of ink that is formed in letters, you can't not, you can't fail to retrieve the information. So you actually can't see it without thinking in a literate way, which rewires our brains in all sorts of ways. We, Henrich gives lots and lots of charts to the effect that we are much more likely to trust strangers, for instance, than uh, people who are from more familial cultures where you're much, you actually, we would think that nepotism is a bad thing, for right, instance, yeah. favoring a family member over someone we don't know. Whereas in many cultures, it's the exact opposite. They would say, how could you not do that? Um, and 
and that means that we are more likely we actually work harder and more likely to work long hours in particular kinds of careers in order to secure a future for our family but much less likely to invest in familial relationships uh, that might last the sense of a whole life a whole lifetime that national at national levels things like corruption are very low um, and as I say trust of strangers is very high but that again is unrepresentative of many we don't tend to think in and this is something Jonathan Haidt talks a lot about we don't even morally we don't tend to assess right and wrong in as many different ways as many cultures do many would right. say that's unfair but they might also say um, and they might say that's harmful which we would but mm. they might also say that's dirty or yeah. that's subversive blasphemous, and that's or, blasphemous yeah. right yeah. so yeah. they would use categories to do, to understand right and wrong and in the west we generally don't we just say no that's if it's harmful or if it's unfair that's bad but we don't really have frameworks for understanding why certain things might be morally wrong yeah. um we are obviously extremely rich everyone listening to this is probably sitting within or standing within 30 seconds of a flush toilet and able you know got ele- electricity port, port within a few yards of you i expect um we can obviously got instant access to more information than's been printed in the history of the world the thing that we're sitting on or standing near is probably built in one country assembled in another country and mm-hmm. been brought to us by means of various container ships and planes and things and we're likely to assume things about democracy, about choice, about the fact that I ought to be able to choose not just a political party, but a marriage partner or a breakfast cereal. And that would be true whether we're male or female, which again, in many cultures wouldn't be true. Um, And then we can talk a bit more, I'm sure, on the ex-Christian and romantic side. But there's there's many, many ways in which we are... Our brains are just formed by a culture that has made us think in different ways than much much of the world does. And that, yes, as you say, the acronym WEIRD, Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, Democratic, is a a common now psychological term for describing the difference between people like you and me and most people listening to this and kind of everyone else who is still much the majority of humanity. And we're going to um, press into um, some of the reasons why that is. And what's fascinating about Joseph Henrik's book, The Weirdest People in the World, is that he says absolutely the weirdness of the West is because of Christianity. Yeah. And he sort of begins by sort of talking about some of the literacy issues and, and how we are people of the book and that has rewired our brains. But what he spends the, the bulk of the book doing is looking at our marriage and family program yeah, and saying, well, as an evolutionary biologist, of, of course he would. Like, you know, reproduction um, is sort of driving his analysis of, of those sorts of things. But what's interesting to me is that that has not been a particularly controversial statement for him to make, that we are weird... Yeah. And we are weird because of Christianity. Um, and I, I, I think I would dispute whether you can hang everything on the marriage and family program. Yeah. Um, I understand why he does it as an evolutionary biologist. Yeah. But that sort of thesis that it's Christianity that has shaped us, that is getting more and more traction these days, would you say? Yes, it, it is. And you're getting it from an evolutionary perspective, from a biological, just sort of deep history perspective. You're also obviously getting it in more common narratives about the values and ideals of the West, which I think become particularly... I think some of that may have been triggered even by the sort of more recent turn in the West towards self you know, I say self critique would be a, a soft term for it but really sort of a, a often a rabid hatred of westernism a sort of self loathing that comes in and and why that phenomenon emerges which most cultures don't really do they they right. are often able to see their flaws but they don't hate themselves and their recent history as much as Western people tend to. And people have started reflecting at a historical level, why is that true? I think it would be true even politically. Um, mm. I think the, if I can call them the 9-11 wars, but the, the sort of mm. the last 20 years in, in the living memory of most people listening to this would be, again, a lot of self-reflection on, well, we we honestly like invaded countries on the basis that it was obvious to everybody that these are the values that would take their place if you'd got rid of a dictator and then 10 years later looked at it and went oh gosh that didn't go at all like we thought it turns yes. out that yes. yeah human rights or democratic values are not innate and even in the last two years with the withdrawal from Afghanistan you you saw sort of you know people are sitting in schools with these sort of you know Afghan girls trying to teach them all about why they should basically be good modern feminists and just seeing the total lack of comprehension right. of what the Western people were saying and realizing this is nothing like as innate as we think. Yeah. And I think that's also fed into a broader sense of reflection in the West. So, okay, are we more unusual than we realized we were? Yes. And 
where does that come from? And I think Henrich's explanation and that of, you know, Tom Holland and others will talk about, I'm sure, is a lot of that, if not all of it, comes from our very specifically Christian roots. And that accounts sometimes for even the anti-Christian impulse that some in our culture experience. Yeah, completely. So like in in my book, The Air We Breathe, I I look at seven values that we now consider to be the air we breathe. And we consider these to be natural and obvious and universal. And they're absolutely nothing of the sort. So I I talk about equality, compassion, consent, especially in the sexual realm, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. And what I find interesting about that is when you reverse those values, you get something that is unequal, cruel, coercive, unenlightened, anti-science, restrictive and regressive. Yeah. And if you hear something that is those things, like that is the worst, isn't it? Yeah. You're like, well, why yeah. are those things the worst? Yeah. Well, because, because Christianity has done a number on us and, and we are all living in this this sort of crater that has been produced by the the Jesus asteroid that has, cra- <laughs> <laughs> that has slow motion crashed yeah. in, into the West. And, and we take that shape now such that we find it odd when other people don't make those same assumptions. Yeah. And, and w- when did you start waking up to, to this particular kind of analysis of, of the West and Christianity? Well, I'd love influence? to say it's because I read your book, Glenn. Yeah. Um, and, but actually, you know, I, I loved your book because I thought you made such a good... you you popularized something very well which i think i had been i've been thinking and noticing a bit but i think you crystallized it brilliantly I, I probably i think the last it's only been really the last five or six years i think the first book that made me see it as a thing was john heights the righteous mind which was right. only published i think in 20 it's 10 years old 12 now. or 13 yeah, right 2012, yeah um and he introduced me to the acronym. I'd never come across the weird morality right. thing before. And that I found really helpful because it, it was it was so vivid. And some of the, even just these extraordinary and sometimes quite grim uh, thought experiments he does where he says to people, okay, a guy buys a, a raw chicken from a supermarket, takes it home, has sex with it. And do you think that's wrong? And watching Western people try to explain why it was without a moral framework for it. Yes, without and, saying, but it's not harming yeah, anybody. Yeah, because they say, it's, so, not, it's not harmful, so how could harming. it be wrong? But yeah. I kind of know in my gut that it is, but I don't right. know why. Right. And uh, lots of examples, like trying, people trying to explain why incest was wrong or whatever. And I, it was just so illuminating. I thought, that's exactly what would happen to my group of friends from university. And yet I don't think I, they would be able to explain why. And it was fascinating to be able to think about that as a particularly a, a Christian Western phenomenon. And so I think that, that got me started down a line which... Then, as I, you know, I won't tell the whole origin story of the book I wrote, but I think I began to realize that there was actually a the, a Christian component driving all of that strangeness of morality, which I was, I think, well on the way to, I, obviously, Tom Holland has shaped both of us quite a lot, I think, with him, and his very much as a sort of history of contrasting the modern West with the ancient Greco-Roman world, which mm. is his field. Mm. And I think realizing, yeah, it's not at all strange for Caesar to say, yes, I went into Gaul and killed a million people. And no one today would regard that as a as a good yes. in a way that he clearly does. It's it like his calling card. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that really helped, even though I'd studied quite a lot of the Greco-Roman world, I just hadn't seen the contrast with the classical world in the way that he yeah, did, and yeah. it really helped. And then I read, yeah, Henrich's book when I was beginning work on my own book and realized, ah, that's, that's mm. great because that's given yeah. me lots of charts yes. and data for yes. what I was already moving towards. And yes. so, yeah, it's a, a combination of those three, eight, Height, Holland, Henrich. There we go, um, all the H's. And, uh, uh, Larry Seidentop was yes. was quite interesting. Well, inventing yes. the individual, um, which has been in the last ten years, isn't it? Um, yes, it's, as, as a book that um, really woke me up to the the sense of we we take it for granted that society is obviously a collective of individuals who we all stand on our own two feet. Yeah, we are equal to one another, and we we just consent to be in this sort of contractual arrangement that we call a society. And if I choose to opt out, I choose to opt out. Yeah. But I am the center of gravity in in political philosophy. And and he's like, well, that that's weird. That that yeah. is so odd. Let's let's go back to ancient societies where you have the paterfamilias, the, the, the head of the household, who acts like this priest king who has, you know, life or death power over others, you know, in yeah. his household, who keeps the fires of the heart Yeah, the hearth burning, are so fascinating. Yeah. Uh, as, as the ancestor worship, and his job is to pass on to the eldest son, that job of being the, the high priest. And even when the Greeks had a thing called democracy, it was, it was the heads of the household, the fathers coming together um, in in order to 
narrow down the options that were actually being decided by divination, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the women in the, in the culture were, were those who are sort of the more prophetic types, and they were hearing from things like the Delphic Oracle, and, and the men were kind of, the, the men as heads of the household were voting on the sorts of things that the Delphic Oracle might say, narrowing down those options. And you're like, that, well, that's not democracy. Yeah. <laughs> in the way yeah, not what we would be used by that word in at way. all. And inventing the individual is just such a, a fascinating thought because we tend to think, you know, what is obvious about a moral framework, for instance, is, well, you just need Immanuel Kant to come along mm. and tell you, give you the categorical imperative, you know, act in such a way that it will... Um, that it you know, ought to be a duty you know, for, everybody to, to, observe, for, for yeah. everybody to observe. And you think, that's all you need. Or if you don't like Immanuel Kant, then come along a, another hundred years and Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill will give you some utilitarianism. You, yeah. If you don't like the duty ethics of Kant, fine, let's go with the Maximize utilitarianism. Maximize pleasure. Happiness. Maximize pleasure. But in both accounts, you've got this sovereign individual yeah. who is obviously equal and, you know, my utils for a utilitarian count the same as yours, count the same as the, you know, whoever in society. And you've already assumed so much yeah. of the invention of the individual as this sort of sovereign who stands before God or before the eyes of the law as this equal um, kind of party in, and, and, and is the center of political understanding. Yeah. Um, and all of that is just borrowed capital from yeah. Christianity. All of it. And so modern people who are just like, oh, you don't need Jesus. You just need Kant. You just need Bentham. And you're like, yeah. no, no, no. You need to trace this story back yeah. a lot, lot earlier. Yeah. I think individualism is so deep that it, that you don't even realize it's an assumption. You, you yeah. just it, it seems innately obvious. And again, one of, that's one of the factors about the 9-11 wars uh, where, where you think, yeah, this, we, this really is so deep in us. We don't think of it as a cultural distinctive. So if you go abroad on a holiday, you notice, obviously, they speak a different language. They do. The, and you laugh and you go, oh, look at the way we eat dinner and all. And maybe if you travel to a very different part of the world, you, you come to realize that there are some other assumptions you hold that are not globally shared. Individualism seems so fundamental to us yeah. that you almost never if you're a western person interact with someone who doesn't at least to some degree share that assumption because the kinds of people even when you travel you, that you're in, interacting with at any in any depth are those who share that assumption and what seed top does which i found so fascinating was to go back to the, sort of the 11th century which is not a period of history i knew very much about and most of us it's not a it's not a period we studied much and really drilled in and said can you see the changes that are taking place that obviously you can trace back to Augustine and then back to Paul and, and Jesus, but particularly in the sort of 10th, 11th, 12th century, the way in which Western people come to think about the individual as a as the sort of almost the fundamental agent in society. It hasn't washed through yet. It hasn't produced mm -hmm. the same, obviously, politically, economically, all of those things. It's still a very, what we would think of as a very feudal society. Very Hierarchical. Authoritarian, right. Mm -hmm. But that the but the the metaphysical transformation, the religious and ultimately most social changes are are religious in nature when you get down to rock bottom, because that's it's the deepest values we hold which are shaping those things. But they're often so deep that you don't know they're there. And individualism is yeah. one of yeah. several like that, which we've forgotten our even values. They seem yes. so innately obvious to us. Yes. So what were some of the assumptions that they're making in, in the eleventh century and the papal reforms? I I guess you know, you could start in Genesis one, and you've got the the, the image of God, male and female. Um, that's obviously huge um, for the history of everything. Um, you've got you know Christ coming as the the highest member of the hierarchy. You know, descending to die the slave's death, to invite us now into a family where we're all brothers and sisters, and no one is Lord except Him. Yeah. You've got the Apostle Paul, and you know, male and female, slave and free, all one in Christ Jesus. You've got Augustine, um, kind of in the debris of you know the, the the western half of the of the Roman Empire being smashed by by the Goths, um, kind of knitting together intellectually knitting together Europe again on the basis of covenant, yeah, rather than on the basis of of, of anything else, ethnicity or or, yeah. or or even family, you know. And then Larry Seiden type is noticing, okay, and um, the church is starting to get very serious about who you cannot marry, and you cannot yeah. marry your seventh cousin, yeah. right? <laughs> like, you cannot marry your first cousin, second, yeah. all the way out to the very yeah. fringes, so that now you're, you're suddenly having to have relationships based on covenant rather than re relationships based on kin, which 
smashes apart the 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 kind of the feudal relationships and the tribal relationships yeah. that, that are going on. And now I start to ha- now there starts to be a need for things like charter towns. I mean, we're we're moving on quite yeah. a bit. In no, the, but in the I think that's the right but, way yeah. to go. I, I I think the only other element that I think is vital in that story is is when we you know you mentioned Augustine. Obviously, this sort of his more City of God is great sort of theoretical framework for the collapse of Western Rome and and as is you know, is obviously on its way and is well underway by his day, but also his confessions, which are this sort of very, an extraordinary text, the one of the most unexpected, you'd sort of place it, if you didn't know it was written or when it was, and you suddenly found it, you'd think it was written a thousand years after. By the romantics, we might get into that. You really would, because it's so personal. And so Mm. he just looks into his own soul so much and obviously does the whole book in the form of a prayer, first person, Mm. and the amount of self-reflection, you know, the the famous line, you know, Lord, I prayed at the time, Lord, make me chase, but not yet. Mm-hmm. And now people use it as a punchline, but at the time, what an extraordinary thing to say. So yeah. that that is in some ways the first the first work that we would recognize now as individualist in a way. And obviously yeah. that's anachronistic in so many ways, but you read it today and the reason it speaks to us is because it talks about the self in the way that we do. And we do because he did. Then, as you say, you've got the sort of making the smaller, the family smaller through the the sort of the first half of the medieval period, really this sort of beginning in the sixth, seventh centuries and then through. But gradually the family is getting smaller and smaller, yeah. That what, what, which doesn't mean people have fewer children. It means that the family network that you operate with doesn't extend to an entire clan. It actually increasingly right. becomes closer to what we would now call us even a nuclear family, but an intergenerational nuclear family mm-hmm. where you are you know everybody in your little, you know, there might be 20 of you, grandparents, down to kids, um, but, and you're very aware of them, but that means that you're, instead of saying, I've now got 300 people who I regard as part of my immediate identity circle, mm. that identity circle's got a lot smaller, which means that the interactions you have with other people in, in the community have to be done in a more neutral way with them as agents and individuals in their own right rather than yes. members of a clan yes. or a tribe that is interacted with somewhat differently. And, and and with more greater levels of trust or distrust according to your relationship with the clan. Yes. And that means that you then do start establishing these sort of, as you said, these institutions like, well, a monastery would be one, actually, right. one of the early ones. Right. And I think that's really interesting as well. I, th- I think uh, a thing that I would add to Joseph Henrik's kind of analysis would be, obviously he focuses on marriage and family program, but yeah. the sexual ethic of, of Jesus was revolutionary in prizing singleness as well, yes. ch- chaste singleness. And so the monasteries and the... And those sorts of religious communities, yeah. again, are absolutely not based on progeny. Um, absolutely not, not, not based on on family. Uh, and you ha- and you have rules. So you've got a rule of Saint Benedict, and you yeah. have a, you know, you have these rules. An Augustinian monk takes these vows. Yeah. And again, it's this idea of the choice of the individual, the consent yes. of the individual, is forming a community around them, rather than. Yeah. I'm just thrown into this world as the son of this guy and, you know, we're, we're a part of this thing. Yeah. And that birth of choice, yes. Kyle Harper, who we're going to talk to on the, um, on the podcast, um, really presses into how the sexual ethic of, of the, the early centuries uh, of Christians kind of foregrounded choice. Yes, and brought about a sense of freedom actually, because here are here are people who are saying no to biological reality and biological necessity, because they're saying no to sex, and and yeah. suddenly consent and choice and communities that are not based on biology but but are based on yeah covenant and, yeah. and these rules that starts to, to work yeah, and it's got huge implications for the economic uh, heft of Western Europe today Mm, and over the last thousand years because one of the things that happens next from there I mentioned the thing about trust like if I'm not related to you and I'm not actually most of the people I trade with I'm not related to either I have to there has to be rules even if they're not like community rules like the rule of St. Benedict but you still need rules that effectively mean I know that if I sell you this at this price you're going to end up honoring that deal and and that the way economics works is no longer based on familial connections or even retribution is based on a sort of common shared understanding of a of a public square that there are certain things I might do at home, but I come and bring myself into the public square. I have to think about myself as someone who's subject to a broader code of norms that treat you with the same degree of dignity if you're related to me and right. if you're if you're not. And that affects um, the tra- the beginning of things like the guilds. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the chartered towns where people say, actually, as a citizen of a of a city or a, of a town or a burger of a borough or a town, yes. you know. A, 
uh, obviously in a lot of European languages that I did with the Berg or the you know the borough or the whatever yeah um, becomes the sort of that's that my identity is tied to this community and and that city becomes more prominent in my self understanding than it ever would have been in the ancient world except insofar as my family were all living there and and of course they begin to think about themselves as agents within a with a political and an economic identity mm-hmm. and then eventually an academic identity because they set up universities and yes. so you end up going you what looks like a very obscure religious thing mon- monasteries and convents yeah. Yeah. but as you build that up over five six hundred years by the time Seton Todd's talking about the 11th 12th 13th century western Europe is thinking in terms of well I belong to a town I may or may not belong to a religious order yes. I belong to a may belong to a guild for my trade and I'm I may have been to a university or I may intend for my son or to study at a university as well and then you're realizing wow there's lots of these non-family entities in which people are finding what we would now call their identity but their yes. a sense of home and a sense of belonging and moral norms and that then meant that intellectual freedom in the university economic power came out of it political power and so the the way in which western europe began to think was shaped again because christianity had effectively put what you've rightly called consent at the heart of some of these relations coupled with the sort of individualistic tradition going back to you know roman seven or yep. augustine's confessions people begin to think about their own motives and scrutinize themselves in that way and the two i think aligned along with some other some other developments create multiple institutions that are not the family yep. not the extended family at all yeah and yep. and really set up all sorts of things that we now take for granted in the modern world yes should we talk about papal reforms in the 11th century um in in terms of you know, here starts to be, as the canon lawyers are processing all of this and yeah. these institutions that are built um, not on family but on covenant, um, they start to speak in the language of rights. Yeah. And this, this was kind of a new development. Um, obviously, Christians knew, I have an obligation to the poor to give to the poor. But what started to be new was, no, the poor have a claim on me, yeah. the rich. And that, that was... This a, is not merely patronage. It's a sense of... Right. It's a sense of obligation. Right. Um, and, the, yeah, the right of the individual, in, in their own right, they have a claim on the resources yeah. of those who are wealthy, which, yeah. which is not the responsibility model of the wealthy should give. Yes. But the poor have a right. And that, that sounds very modern. All it does sudden. sound very modern. And I think it's, and it's coupled with the other thing that's happening in the papal reforms, which is, of course, the idea that, the, that the, there is, and there's many things happening, but there's the, the power of the state is confined by the authority of the church yeah. because ultimately the king is beneath God in the hierarchy. And we see this very iconic, famous scene, sorry, it's an overused word, but um, where the Pope excommunicates the emperor and the emperor faffs around for a bit going, what am I going to do? But eventually it says, yeah, the emperor has to come and repent in the snow <laughs> on his hands and knees. The door shut in his face. Yeah, right. And, and, and yeah. it's just an extraordinary, so this is in 1076, so 700 years yeah. before my, yeah. my period, <laughs> I guess you could call it. Um, but, it's a, a really extraordinary moment because at that point, again, the, the power of who would in any society would be taken for granted as the top of the hierarchical tree yes. has been subjected to the power of the, the authority of the Pope and effectively saying, you know, your, your right to govern is given to you by God and if you don't fall in line. And you, those two things together, you relativize human worldly power at the same time as lifting up the rights of individuals and you end up with a more theological account of who owes who what. Right. And then you put that together with the more individualistic community developments we've referred to almost in, in society as a whole in Europe. And you can see how you end up with a group uh, uh, you know, millions, billions of people today thinking, obviously, individuals have rights and those rights are innate and rooted fundamentally, I think, in theology, but we won't call it that anymore, no. um, rather than in where I belong to a particular family or community. But to yeah. this day, many people globally don't think that way at all about no. where their identity is found and where their rights, if they even use that language, come from. <laughs> Especially because it's so shocking to tell people, you can thank med- medieval monks yeah, yeah. for secularism. That's exactly the very thing. Because right. that, and exactly right, because we generally think of, and it, you know, we often, well, obviously, having this conversation, you know, a few miles away from uh, Pevensey Castle mm. um, in southern England, you just go and you look at an old tumble down castle like that now, and it just it symbolizes sort of 
what people often call the dark ages and they think, oh, well, that was the world that we used to have, but now we're in, in this new bright one. And you think, actually, the assumptions you have about individual rights and the relationship between the state and the authority and agency of individuals and how large families are and whether you can marry your cousins and all of those sorts of things are grounded in this world that you feel is so dark, but yeah. actually that's where you got a lot of it from. It's just full of boils and bubonic plague and that's that's all that we think Turnips of. As Turnips. Turnips well. yeah. <laughs> when we think of the dark ages. And I'm, you know... I even I remember writing a uh, an article that you know about don't be a medieval um, what was it don't be a medieval youth worker and it, it was this sort of tirade against <laughs> and what I meant was Pelagian really but yeah. but medieval just becomes yeah. uh, a synonym for backwards yeah. rubbish yeah. broken and I find myself even like having studied some of this stuff <laughs> found myself the other day saying oh my Wi-Fi it's positively medieval <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. which is so anachronistic it doesn't mean anything unless medieval has become a synonym for rubbish yeah backward know, and yeah you know. which which it kind of is and maybe one of the reasons for that is we haven't mentioned a, a certain uh member of a charter town a citizen of a charter town who was also an augustinian monk yeah who was also a, a university faculty member so he had, he had sort of all three yeah in this story martin luther He's often sort of called the you know the man at the at the the hinge of, of these two ages the you know the first modern man who who brought us from medieval period in, into modernity, and in the mythology, and we might press into in, in the ways in which this is a mythology, but in the mythology, he stands against both pope and, and emperor on the basis of his conscience. Yeah, that's the sort of the way the way the story is told, and so what a very modern man Martin Luther is as a single man standing up against the entire hierarchy and saying here I stand I can do no other and certainly that telling of the story thrills our Protestant hearts doesn't it it does and I think it's you know he probably didn't say the final punchline (laughs) and he probably wasn't doing it simply as individualistically as all that and in many ways he's more the last medieval than the first modern I think in in a Mm. lot of ways but Yes, that, I think the idea of the of the the Disney version of the story, which is effectively the Disney version of every story, is that this individual discovers who they truly are by looking into their hearts and confronting the world. I think if you were trying to look for an individual who was the forerunner of that trend, Luther does he does work as a as a sort of a, a, a totemic figure because he is obviously is a tremendously courageous man and he does speak about the importance of not going against your conscience and he does go on a very rapid transformation uh, theologically between 1516 and 1520 or 21 that most people haven't traveled anything like that far in their lifetimes and he did right. in the space of four or five years so i think you know and you don't want to take away from that right? this is an absolutely yeah. extraordinary yep. figure yep. but again you would say yes at the heart of this sort of modern conception of selfhood and lots of things mm-hmm. we talk about a lot now they're not the language luther would have used but mm-hmm. selfhood and identity and individuality and freedom of expression all those things you'd say yeah martin luther again the most sort of the embodiment of a late medieval early modern christian is expressing all of those ideals and that's one of the reasons why he's popular not just as a protestant figure but even as a modern figure as yes. you say it's a sort of yeah. seems to be a transitional guy in yeah. the history of yeah. western thought yes and rightly so i think and you know and, and as christians we we do believe that there was a man who stood between the ages who yes. took us from took us from darkness to light we we kind of we do believe in an enlightenment you know that that happened in the first century um the light shines in the darkness the darkness has not overcome it and so how could this story not in some ways resonate with us that there was this luther figure who stood up against the priests and at great cost to himself you know just like christ here comes martin luther but then there starts to be this sense of luther's um, very theological critique of the medieval church starts to be i think in the popular imagination a, a wholesale rejection of medieval times yes and we cast them as the dark ages yeah and it's this incredibly christian and then protestant mythos um not not saying that many aspects of the story aren't true but just that they resonate with us at a gut level that here here is this person who stands up against the priests brings us from darkness into light and all the old must be rejected the old is gone the new has come and that starts to be not just a, a description of uh, a poor theology of salvation. It becomes a wholesale rejection of, of hierarchy, a wholesale rejection of um, 
institutions, a wholesale rejection of, 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 of that, that way that we, you know, so that now medieval is just, you know, a, a, a terrible word. And I can think of other icons that sort of come, you know, maybe a hundred years later, you think of someone like a Galileo. Mm. And, um, I mean, Protestants loved the Galileo story. Because here was this other man who stood up against the priests, yeah. who and and again the mythos around the story really needs some myth busting yeah. <laughs> in terms of the the details of the story, but we resonate with the story of one man mm. standing against the institution. Yes, it's too good not to be true, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the truth, and he and you know and you'll hear people like serious people and intellectuals even say you know he was burnt alive for for what he said he wasn't burnt alive what are you talking yeah. about <laughs> he was engaged in a titanic battle of ego with the pope yeah. <laughs> and they used to be friends and it all fell apart um but we thrill to the story of this one man overturning the darkness yes and moving into the light and then i wonder we come into the enlightenment period and once more you know, we've got a new batch of heroes that are bringing us, and it's not just Luther taking us out of medieval Catholicism. It's now the Enlightenment figures bringing us out of Christianity wholesale. Maybe. Yeah. So you ha you have um. So the first time somebody uses the term the Middle Age in yes. in English is in the same year as the Gunpowder Plot in 1605, okay. in, which in, yeah. in for non-British listeners is a you know really. Um, we still celebrate it. I, I don't know what quite how <laughs> so you probably bizarre, know, Australian it? probably think it's very weird, but sort of celebrate it by, you know, sometimes burning effigies in a town quite near us, but mainly just having yeah. fireworks and bonfires. But so in 1605, there's a sort of plot to destroy the uh, a Catholic plot to destroy the Protestant government effectively. And in that, and that's the year that you first hear the term, the middle age surrounded by, I love the way they write, thicky foggies of darkness <laughs> and ignorance, you know, in that sort of old, old yes. English way. Um, and, and it's a term really to describe there was a middle age of Catholicism between the early church and the what for the writer is the Protestant period. Right. But within 100 odd years, maybe 150 years, it's become, and uh, I talk a lot about this in, in, in my book on 76, because that's the year that Edward Gibbon published, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And he's now mm. using middle age as the Christian period between the right. ancient world and the modern which would, we would now call the Enlightenment world. He, right. he wasn't yet calling it that, but that's the idea. So what, the, what he's done is he's taken the shape of the story that he got from the Protestants, which is you have early church, Catholicism bad, mm -hmm. Protestantism good, and he's transposed it into an Enlightenment story that we would now all recognize, which is ancient world of paganism, right. sunny, happy, chipper, yep. then yep. you know medieval Christendom, Ooh, the, and the, then the storm clouds have come right, in, and, and it's all it dark all and dreary, and all that. Stevensy Castle, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I dare say, and then the modern world in which you know light, science, reason, and all the rest, which I know we'll come on to in in subsequent conversations. And I, but what he's what Gibbon has done, and many others like him, but Gibbon was particularly good at it is to to take a Christian shape of the story, the Protestant shape of story, and just change the characters. Yes. And it's a very reassuring narrative because yes. it means that people like you and me and all our neighbours and friends are on the right side of history. We're right. sitting here now today going, we're actually the heroes of this story. Right. And the bad guys are the ones who right. tried to destroy, you know, reason and understanding and we're the we're the light ones. And yes. that story's got as you say, that's why we tell the Galileo story and the Luther story the way we do, because we're very keen to see ourselves in that mould as yes. the heroic figure yes. challenging the, the darkness and switching the lights on. And yet it's such a Christian story. Yeah. <laughs> it's so because it's a story of Jesus. It's a story yeah. of the old has gone, the new has come, and the light right. shines in the darkness and the darkness hasn't overcome it. Right. But we've just we've changed not just the characters now, but also the timeline. And it yeah. said the turning point of history is the 18th century-ish rather yeah. than yeah. AD 30 or whenever it was. Right. I always love um, so Thomas Paine, who again lived in in a town very very near us for a, for a bit. Um, We're discovering everything important happened in Sussex. In Sussex. That's really it's, great. it's all about Sussex. <laughs> so he he wrote the Age of Reason, and yeah. you know to to supersede this this darkened age of faith, we are now living in an age of reason, and and he he describes the the, the previous one thousand years as uh, a sandy plain in which no no shrub can be seen, right, yeah. and. That is behind us, and we are moving towards the sunny uplands. And 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 you're like, well, that that is so incredibly biblical. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Can you can you think of a people who are moving out of the out of the desert yeah. time, <laughs> into yeah. a promised land? Yeah. And even as we try to escape Christianity, we can't help but do it in Christian terms. Yeah. Which is the great irony, isn't yeah. it? That that the Enlightenment is basically transposing a Christian story. Yeah. And we are now the Messiah. Yes. <laughs> you know. 
Ro- and, Roman and, Christ. I mean, Pepin might, again, in, in 1776, in his document, Common Sense, which is, will be very well known to American listeners, he compares us again to, like, Noah stepping out of the flood. And going, here we go. We've got, we can start the world again because it's almost right. like the old world has been destroyed in a flood. And now here we go. Right, let's re-begin. We have it in our right. power to begin the world over again. Right. That's such a Western statement. It's just yes. the way modern people think about our yes. our agency, our individuality, and our our importance, to be honest. We are the ones we've been waiting for. Yes. You know, <laughs> we are the Messiah. And hence your book, Remaking yeah. the World. And, and that's taken from the Thomas Paine kind of quote. So we, we've done the history of the world up until 1776, the year of our Lord, 1776. Um, should we just finish with... Um, I, I loved the bit in your book uh, where you draw attention to the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Thomas Jefferson um, says, we hold these truths to be, now I'll say it, I'll say it the way everybody knows it, yeah. and then you can correct me. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and yeah. something about the consent of the governed. Yeah. Right. That's how that's we- That's very good for a non-American, that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's how we all know the, the, the phrase, and yet- Jefferson did not write, we hold these truths to be self-evident. No, it's, it's really interesting. So Jefferson's, Jefferson wrote to Franklin in late June, hmm. um, to Benjamin Franklin, um, and said, I, I, here's my draft. I wonder if you could make any comments. Basically, he said it in a more ponderous, flowery way. Hmm. Um, and he wrote, and what he had originally written, and you can see the draft, there's pictures of the draft online, it's fascinating to see. But what he'd written is, we, we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. Wow. Um, and Franklin, among many, many edits, it wasn't the only edit he made, but you just see, he just puts a line through sacred and undeniable and replaces it with self-evident. Mm. And it's just such a powerful metaphor for what the West has done, which is to mm. take hold of truths that are essentially sacred in nature. They're grounded in religion, not in reason. They're grounded in Christian assumptions about the world. And you can see that if you see where Jefferson got his phrasing from, because Jefferson gets it from John Locke, and John Locke gets it from Hooker, and Hooker gets it from the Code of Justinian and Matthew's Gospel. And you can see the sort of the origin story of that phrase and, and all the things that are in it. But Franklin says, no, it's not. Because if we say it's sacred, that implies that it's somehow transcendent, and that's not the kind of document we want to write. We want to write right. one in which this is just obvious to all reasonable people. And surely right. anyone who thinks long and hard enough about it can conclude that it's, it's clear that they are self-evident. Now, the obvious response is, no, it's not self-evident. That's the reason you're writing this document and yeah. arguing with Britain about it. Yeah. And it's a lot of people in the world, even today, don't still don't believe that right. and don't think, right. certainly don't think it's obviously true. Right. So Jefferson was actually right. He said, no, these are sacred truths, but they've been so thoroughly baked into Western society by the time even Ben Franklin wrote his letter yeah. that he could say self-evident and everyone would go, yeah, sounds about right. Right. Um, which is a, just a fascinating I think parable for the yes. way in which the post-Christian West has said we're going to keep the Christian assumptions and we're going to gradually try and remove the foundations that got us there. Right. And Peter Berger has, has called Christianity its own grave digger in yeah. that sense th- that it has become so obvious to us that you don't need it. Yeah. Are self-evident. Yeah. Um, and yet I, I have found so, so. So should we think about something practical to finish with? Um, I have found it really fruitful in my evangelism to press into, hey, you know the human rights thing, like how evident is it really? Yeah. Yeah. And to say, um, I, I think actually it, it, as Westerners, we're sort of living in a castle in the air and it's been built by Christianity, yay Christianity, but without the Christian foundations, it's not like we need to take a leap of faith up there. Yeah. We believe in the inviolable worth and equal dignity of every member of the human family. Why? Yeah. Because... If I look at any two people and I measure them according to any one metric, well, this guy's going to be smarter than that guy. This guy's going to be tougher than that guy. This guy's going to be more economically viable than this guy. In what sense are they equal? Like, equal how? Equal in what? And people start to see, oh, yeah, it's a belief, isn't it? Yeah. I am a believer. It's it's not actually evidence that has led me to just a foundational way that I orient myself in the world. Yes. We're all living by faith. And I think just, just taking people on that one step in their journey has been helpful for me. Have, have you discovered something H- similar? Hugely. Because I think in the end, it's easier to say to somebody, uh, you believe this and here's why you're right huh. than here's, you believe this and here's why you're wrong. Now, th- huh. of course, all of us yeah. have beliefs that need to be affirmed and challenged in light of the gospel, including mm-hmm. including Christians. Um, 
But it's a it, it's just so much more of an appealing approach to be able to say these convictions you hold are very dear to you, mm-hmm. but actually they only hold up on Christian premises. Right. Um, and Yuval Noah Harari, his his books, you know, Sapiens and, and many and other Homodeus and other books have been huge bestsellers. Mm-hmm. You know, Barack Obama, Bill Gates endorsements, thirty mm-hmm. million copies, sort of big wow. hits. And he, it's a fascinating section in his book where he says, in the end, that's not what biology teaches us at all. In fact, evolutionary biology would say animals are not remotely equal and we've only got a couple of inalienable commitments and those are to have as many kids as we can and try to minimize the amount of pain we suffer. That's really what, that's what's self-evident if right. you look at the world, the natural world. Right. The, the convictions that were expressed in the Declaration and that everyone listening to this holds to some degree hmm. uh, are ultimately only come from Christianity. And Harari He's saying this as someone who's thoroughly opposed, really, to Christian values in many ways, but is p- completely willing to grant that that is really what they are, yeah. and quite how he squares the circle, and how many of our neighbours and friends square the circle is re- still to be seen. Yes. So yeah, I think it's a, a very good way of approaching discussions with people. Yeah, and so we're not we're not inviting you to believe something you don't believe in in this particular part of the conversation we're, we're inviting you to have some foundations for the thing that you you say already you believe, do believe that, yeah that you, you know and I, I just think of a, a friend who wrote to me and said um of course you realize glenn i could never be a believer and it was so bizarre because yeah. she's she's a much better person than i am and lives her life and, and she actually encounters people as though they have inviolable worth and dignity yeah. whereas me not so much but it's like <laughs> she she clearly believes this stuff and and showing showing people that it's not self evident, but that it's actually a commitment of faith, and it's an incredibly Jesus shaped thing, yeah. means you can then introduce the substance of Jesus as as the one who gives you the ground beneath your feet, rather yeah. than the one who just impels you to, to to leap. I think. Yes. Should we leave it there for now? Let's. Okay. So that was that was episode one of uh, of post Christian, and uh, we would love Christianity. Post Christian. Oh, what did I say? What did I call <laughs> I it? think you said post Christian. Post Christian. Yeah. Post Christianity. <laughs> question mark. And the question mark is important because uh, we want to we want to figure out like how post are we as post Christians, and uh, in future episodes we'll figure out uh, what that means. We'll figure out all sorts of caveats um, to what we've said in this episode. But we would love to know what you think, and uh, we would love it if you could please uh, subscribe to us uh, on the podcasts we are a production of the keller center for cultural apologetics which is the ministry of the gospel coalition and uh, if you could like and subscribe to uh, this on youtube or uh, share it around on uh, your social media of choice subscribe to us on your podcatcher of choice give us a rating and review that would really help us to get seen uh, we're going to do about eight episodes of we this are. and we've got some very exciting guests coming up including kyle harper who we have mentioned in this episode but uh, andrew thank you so much thank you so much